When was the last time you took part in a festival that lasted seven days? One of the most popular celebrations in Spain is going on right now and running through this Saturday. It might not be as well known outside the European country as, say, the running of the bulls, but that's scheduled for July. And at the Sevilla Fair in the southern Spanish community of Andalusia, scores of people take part in the annual tradition that involves days of dancing, costumes of cascading colors, parades, nostalgia, laughter, and dining together. A 41-year-old visitor says traditions have to be lived and that he's been living this one since he was a kid. The Sevilla Fiesta has its roots in a livestock fair that was first held in the mid-1800s. From Spain, we're traveling to India next on The World from A to Z, and we're so thankful you could come along. I'm Coral Azus. It's set to be the biggest election in world history. India is a federal parliamentary republic with Earth's largest population. Of the 1.4 billion people who live here, almost a billion are eligible to vote. Polls open Friday and results won't be in by Saturday. The vote itself takes place in phases until June 1st and then the counting begins. The election from start to finish is expected to take more than a month. The nation's Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, is so popular that it's almost certain he'll win another five-year term. He's served two terms so far and he's taken several steps to appeal to India's Hindu majority. About 80% of Indians follow that religion, with just over 14% being Muslim, just over 2% being Christian, and just under 2% being Sikh. Varanasi, an ancient city heaving with humanity, religion woven into the fabric of life here, like the rickshaws weaving in and out of traffic, or the tang of turmeric, cumin, and coriander from the Gola Dinanat spice market hundreds of years old. I'm Will. Here I meet a shopkeeper. Nice to meet you. Akash Jaiswal, who's full of praise for India's popular Prime Minister, Narendra Modi. What makes him different from others? What he says, he has done. When you hear him speak, do you feel like he's speaking to you and your yeah, life? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, because he, is, he, he speaks with heart. Modi was not born here. He chose to represent this Hindu spiritual center. Leading up to the elections, Modi inaugurated a temple dedicated to Lord Ram, one of Hinduism's most revered deities, built on the site of a Muslim mosque demolished decades ago by Hindu hardliners. Something which has not happened before in Indian politics among all our prime ministers, he willfully creates a cult of his own personality. And many say Modi is stoking the fires of religious tensions, empowering the Hindu majority and marginalizing the Muslim minority. The first term that came to my mind was scary. Scary? Yeah, it's scary. I sat down with Sana Sabah as she was celebrating the end of Ramadan with her family, all of them worrying if this is the end of a secular Indian government and will it mean the end of their religious and civil rights. And there are other things she worries about, like high youth unemployment, low wages, widespread poverty, not to mention corruption. But polls still show Modi's popularity is pushing 80%. Modi's own path from poverty to politics is part of his appeal for a lot of people here in India. His official biography says he's the middle son of a chaiwala, a tea seller, a humble upbringing that he says helps him understand the problems plaguing everyday people. Modi says his programs put more food on their tables. Plus, the government hands out cash and cooking gas, and they provided water and power and sanitation services. Modi's also getting a lot of respect abroad. Today, India is strong, capable, and self-reliant under the prime minister's leadership. In Modi's India, majority rules, and he's expected to win a commanding majority of India's nearly one billion eligible voters. The biggest democratic election in the history of mankind, making Modi one of the most popular and powerful leaders in the world, even if some feel they may be left behind. On this date in world history. April 17, 1524 was the first time Europeans sailed into what would later be known as New York Harbor. It was one of the discoveries made by Italian explorer Giovanni da Verrazzano and his crew along their journey up and down the North American East Coast. A bridge between Brooklyn and Staten Island is named after Verrazzano. Canada became a fully independent country on this date in 1982. 
Following the Canada Act earlier that year, when the British Parliament approved the North American country's constitution, Britain's Queen Elizabeth II declared Canada's independence on April 17th. And on this date in 1986, one of the longest alleged wars in world history ended without a single shot being fired. Peace was formally declared between the Netherlands and the Isles of Scilly off Britain's southwest coast. The conflict was said to have lasted for 335 years after Dutch ships were damaged during the English Civil Wars. But the Netherlands never attacked Scilly, and some historians doubt there was ever really war between those two sides. Upward and out. Wangari Mathai, the first African-American woman awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, was from what country? Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, Sudan. Mathai, who received the award for her work towards sustainable development, democracy, and peace, was from Kenya. The CIA World Factbook says Kenya's been a relatively stable country since it won its independence from Britain in 1963. And the fact that it has a growing economy, along with a growing tourism industry, has encouraged conservation of Kenya's remarkably diverse wildlife. You might remember Kipike, the completely spotless, reticulated giraffe. He's doing great, but in the wild, his species is endangered. There are only about 8,000 wild reticulated giraffes left. So, veterinarians and rangers at the Maasai Mara National Reserve in Kenya are springing into action. The group fitted giraffes with GPS tracking units, and that's no easy feat. Reticulated giraffes can weigh anywhere from 2,000 to 4,000 pounds. And like any interactions with wild animals, it can be dangerous. To tag them, the team loads up tranquilizer darts and sets out to find a target. From there, it's a scramble to get the loopy giraffe fitted with a tracker before it wakes up again. The tiny monitor fits to the tail, and then the giraffes can be on their merry way. The conservation group will monitor how giraffes use spaces in diverse habitats across Kenya, providing vital data to aid conservation strategies. With Kenya's seasons changing, its dry season is moving closer into the rainy season. Giraffes have moved close to human-dominated spaces to find food. This kind of migration and this kind of movement causes human wildlife conflict because it, um, the giraffe happen to come into contact with a lot of humans. You see a lot of spearing or intended or unintended snares. And that human interaction could be deadly for many giraffes. Aside from the danger of the snares, giraffes are often illegally killed for their meat. And more run-ins with humans means more run-ins with potential hunters. The group will track the migratory patterns of these giraffes, hoping that they can remove fences and other man-made roadblocks on their natural path within the reserve. We know we have quite a few homeschoolers watching stateside and from places as far away as Africa and Asia, like the country of Mongolia we discussed on yesterday's show. We see you and we thank you. From the North Star State of Minnesota, it's great to have Miss Ketura or Ketura's class watching from First City School. It's part of the Northwestern Minnesota Juvenile Center in Bemidji. And from the Sunflower State of Kansas, hello to Mr. Gehring's class, a different Mr. Gehring than the one we mentioned before. Woodland Spring Middle School in Olathe is the home of the stallions. Officials have been concerned for years about space junk, old rocket parts or satellite debris smacking into something valuable in orbit. This piece recently smacked into something valuable on Earth. Last month, a four inch metal object blasted through a family's roof in Florida and punched a hole through two floors. NASA had a look and found it was part of a cargo pallet released years ago from the International Space Station. It was expected to totally burn up in Earth's atmosphere, but well, it didn't. Thankfully, no one was hurt. That shock would be otherworldly. And once people stopped orbiting the damage, you could see how they'd go through the roof if their insurance policy didn't have space for alien invasions by flying junk. That IS isn't the way you want to tour the International Space Station by having it come to you. But things are still looking up as long as nothing else comes down. I'm Carl Azuz for the world from A to Z. Thanks for looking us up. You mean the 